Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Bonjour à tous. I'm Sana de Corcel and I'm very pleased to introduce and moderate this session today. In 45 minutes, uh, you'll understand the essential building block in controlling the health crisis. We'll try to, um, like the ability to analyze the health situation, to understand the kinetics uh, and to act from global to local level. In a context where uh, the film evolves with the actors playing their own role, where we start, when the cultures were mobilized to advance uh, science, the political leaders take decisions to limit the spread and the effect of the crisis, where citizens act according to stimuli and sources that can that are more and more numerous and even contradictory, uh, and where health professionals whose commitment in the current pioneer uh, has to be upload, uh, act to support and care for the patients. For 45 minutes, uh, I propose to bring the light uh, in the, to light persons who count and support situation. Um, person who contributes to science, who uh, unfortunately will not join us today, uh, Dr. Uh, Sal uh, from uh, Institut Pasteur uh, at, in Dakar. Um, but we will uh, add a person who acts uh, on the ground locally. Um, all of them bring essential information to those who decide on public policies. None of them has an easy role and we thank them for being with us today and to better understand where do you go from here. That's the title of this session. To save uh, precious uh, um, speaking time, I propose to introduce the panelists uh, by their function when I address them. And I invite you to consult their detailed biographies available in the Paris Peace Forum platform. Two quick points before starting with the panelists. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge pr the projects uh, selected at the Paris Peace Forum this year uh, and future uh, for this session. Named first, a vaccine equity developing a social enterprise to bring imperialist uh, COVID-19 vaccine to the world by Imperial College London. And the second one is international cross-border scientific coordination across the Pasteur International Network, a strong candidate case for clinical therapy against COVID-19 by Institut Pasteur Korea. You can learn about, uh, more about those projects through the Paris Peace Forum platform. The second uh, quick point is uh, at the launch of this session, you also, the number of cases on the dashboard provided by the Center of, the, of Systems Science and Engineering at the John Hopkins uh, University to illustrate the work uh, of our speakers. Um, and we have to pay tribute to uh, those um, uh, people who are uh, fighting against the virus. Uh, at this stage, we have um, 5100 uh, million sorry, cases globally and 1.2 million uh, global deaths. Um, this session uh, is also for, uh, for uh, all people uh, fighting against uh, this virus. Now I will start uh, this dis discussion with um, Professor uh, Neil Ferguson. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for, for being with us. You are the Vice Dean of uh, the School of Public Health at the Imperial College uh, London and advisor to uh, several governments and international organizations on disease control policy making through intervention modeling. Um, my first question would be, what are your main takeaways from this year of living with the pandemic? That's an interesting question. And I don't think there's one answer which spans the whole world. I think the world has had different experiences. I think if we focus on Europe, for instance, then the key lessons I think learned around the importance of early testing, and testing more than just at borders, but in one's population, because I think another lesson has been that border restrictions, short of what Taiwan and New Zealand have done, do not work to um, really contain spread. I think the other lesson is that, you know, adopting a suppression strategy, whilst it has saved many, many lives around the world, um, Europe, elsewhere, um, is a very difficult enterprise and comes with enormous costs associated with it. I 
think it avoided health systems becoming overwhelmed, but we are still struggling with that balance of keeping the disease in check right now and um, having societies open and economically productive. And that is a challenge we will be living with for the next few months or maybe all the way through next year. I think other areas of the world, low and middle income countries, have struggled even more in terms of economic impacts and that balance. And whilst I think nearly all countries have slowed spread, they haven't necessarily been able to contain or suppress the virus. And that's been reflected in the mortality and morbidity we've seen worldwide. And for governments, how to find this right compromise between protecting the population, especially the most vulnerable people, as you said before, and keeping the economy and social uh, and the society afloat? I mean, I think that's fundamentally a political and societal decision. Um, there isn't, again, any one right answer. As everyone aware, the I mean, there has been a lot of polarization, and in some sense, the political and societal consensus which existed in March is now fragmenting in many European countries, North America, Latin America, and these are very difficult decisions to make. Just in the last few weeks, we've seen measures be tightened across the European continent um, by governments who really didn't want to lock down again because of the economic impact. The thing which has forced them to is the virus itself, hospitals filling up and the healthcare demand increasing and wanting to keep a functioning healthcare system in place. I'm afraid in other areas of the world which haven't been able to, just because of limitations of what can be done and people's need to go out and shop and buy food and work, haven't been able to suppress the virus. We have seen health systems enormously stressed in the last few months and continue to be, for instance, in Latin America, and, and an enormous death toll, which I think in many cases has been as yet not fully comprehended through official statistics. Thank you for this uh, broad view uh, of the situation. And maybe I can turn uh, to um, uh, Dr. Zenad Zuleiman Khan. Um, doctor, you are a Global Health of Nursing and Quality Coordinator at the Aga Khan uh, Health Services. And as a, a doctor, uh, you have led the COVID-19 and response capacity report across the geography uh, the Agathon Development Network works, including uh, in the remote areas, while uh, also being uh, involved in the community of uh, efforts. You worked also on the ground when there uh, was a major increase of COVID-19 patients in the Agathon Development Network hospitals, Dar es Salaam. Um, my question is, Simple, but uh, there is no uh, simple answer. But what initiatives are you putting in place in response to the to this crisis that could be replicated elsewhere? Thank you, Sana. Uh, before I respond to your uh, question, I want to quickly introduce the Aga Khan Health Services, Aga Khan Development Network, and Aga Khan Health Services to put some context to to where I work and and the work uh, we have been doing in various communities. Uh, Aga Khan Development Network, founded and guided by His Highness the Aga Khan, uh, brings together a number of development agencies, institutions, and programs that really work in the poorest parts of Asia and Africa. The Aga Khan Health Services uh, is one of three agencies that support activities in health, along with Aga Khan Foundation, Aga Khan University, and together uh, with the health agencies and the non-health agencies, we as African Development Net Network uh, created a framework to respond to uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So one of the things which I think, coming to your question, uh, Sana, um, AKDNs uh, we utilize a systems thinking and a framework at a very early stage of the covid uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, we knew that our institutions are working in extremely poor communities and countries, and we needed to be really proactive about it. Uh, one of the first early stages, we, what we did was to involve our communities uh, through joint community and health services interactions and dialogues. 
uh, we reinforced uh, preventative measures very early in 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 this in the pandemic uh, about uh, masks and hand hygiene and physical distancing etc we used utilize social media platform the whatsapp and the facebook there was a time i had so many whatsapp group in, on my phone that i was losing track of of things happening because that's where the the real uh, uh, importance of communication was i think something which we really are uh, used effectively was the community health workers lady health visitors the real workers in the communities who helped us get these messages to the community so i think uh, as we go along the use of motivated and well prepared grassroots level staff along with the use of technology is something which we could really replicate in the future as well second second point which i think is very pertinent to what neil was also talking about is really the effect of availability uh, of ppes and and vaccines etc aga khan development network has a global presence and i think something which we did well and i would like to share it with the broader community and and the audience is our initiate uh, our initiative of uh, a global network aga khan development network purchasing program think about it when america and europe was struggling to uh, to get ppes and ventilators we have our communities in east africa uh, in in north in central asia in chitral in gilgit in in tajikistan trying to get uh, appropriate ppes ventilators uh, and now vaccination which is coming up how how would we have done that and something which i think uh, our akdn global purchase network program did very well is to ensure they worked uh, globally but they were really looking at the needs uh, locally so that i think is another initiative which i would put in front uh, uh, to the audience that looking at this a pandemic like this it was it is not easy to just manage it at a local level we had to go globally and and really look at our issues and solutions globally very interesting doctor and uh, you know that uh, we the international community um, uh, moved from the the millennium development goals to the sustainable development goals uh, acting that uh, um, there is uh, no uh, difficulties and crises in the source and solutions in the north are uh, saying acknowledging that we are all developing countries so we all have to face challenges um, including health so i would just like to ask uh, uh, professor uh, professor Robertson uh, do you think this kind of uh, advice is coming from uh, Dr. Zainab Zulaiman Khan uh, could apply also uh, for the UK as uh, you have a contact from London by Dr. Yeah I mean I think there are many lessons which are are common to all countries regardless of of development status and and it has been noticeable in this pandemic that there have been some examples of i mean much more rapid responses for one thing africa locked down at the same time as europe and effective responses i think um the challenge and the differences between different areas have been around the longer term both health and economic capacity to sustain interventions um and clearly the economic shock to the world has been enormous throughout but it has been i think much harder on low and middle income countries which have been significantly affected than necessarily on high income countries um and you can see that playing out particularly when I mean, we work with many colleagues in latin america which has been especially hardly hard hit where initially very successful lockdowns were put in place in many but not all countries um but they found it difficult to sustain and and the consequences of that has has been you know a long sustained and and deadly epidemic across much of that continent um so but undoubtedly the the importance of of communication and clear um community cohesion and provision of services um of of trusted communication between for instance government and the population is important everywhere and um 
yeah, um, with this uh, trend to, to, to explain this um, way to learn from each other, um, Dr. Zenat uh, Zuleiman Khan, what partnerships with other actors have you developed and uh, what kind of results uh, can you uh, uh, present us today? That's a very good question. COVID made us appreciate and in fact demanded a deeper understanding of the linkages, relationships and, and partnerships. I think uh, um, some of the key partnerships have been our governments, our communities, our staff, uh, the bodies like WHO and, and universities who were guiding us with science related to the disease and the spread and so and so forth. And last but not the least, the donor communities. Uh, within AKDN, uh, Neil talked about uh, the COVID being a health issue as well as a very strong ec economical issue. And that's what I think within AKDN we did. We really worked very uh, closely with health agencies as well as agencies which are dealing with, with uh, food distribution, agencies which are distribution with, uh, with the habitat and, and, and education, etc. So that partnership was extremely important within our community. We would have never been able to be ready and prepared to respond to COVID in East Africa, in Pakistan, in Tajikistan, if the Ministry of Health have not partnered with us to give us quick uh, approvals to get various uh, importation of various um, uh, uh, items and PPEs, uh, training, capacity building, MOH, private hospitals, private systems, and public systems really gel together to deal with uh, this, this pandemic. Uh, WHO, CDCs, and many universities, including yours, Neil, we, they, you, we, we all got together to really look at the science of, of this disease and, and to get day-to-day -day, uh, new science, new ideas, new solutions, and protocols, etc. I cannot uh, uh, thank our donors enough uh, just to name name a few, the French Development Agency uh, and KFW, the German agency, and many more really have given us uh, 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 the donations, uh, the donations which really helped us provide um, uh, field hospitals in the middle of, of northern Pakistan and Tajikistan and Afghanistan, where, where without these generous donations, we would have never been able to get to the, uh, the, the taking care of the patients in the critical care areas. So really, uh, this pandemic would not have been possible for us to, one agency uh, to deal with uh, if the multi-agency corporation uh, had not been there. Uh, it's, it's really, as we said, you know, the silver lining, we all were in the same boat and we were all struggling to respond to it together. So I think partnerships really played a very important role here. Thank you, thank you very much. And we have partnership and we also have uh, this cross-sectorial uh, activity. Um, we are not dealing with only a health crisis and to deal with this health crisis, we have to uh, act with other sectors. Um, and Professor Ferguson, uh, how could states and other stakeholders uh, better coordinate in their, their, their response frameworks? Yes, I think it's been a mixed picture in this pandemic. Um, I think, for instance, um, the scientific community globally has worked together quite remarkably. I mean, sharing data, analysis, you know, developing vaccines in you know, record time. I mean, that has been a real success story. I think in other respects, if we talk about state-to-state -state relations, we've seen certainly in some areas of the world, including Europe and, and I think North America, um, Latin America, really quite a diversity of responses. No two countries adopting the same methods and maybe less interstate cooperation and coordination than would have been optimal. Um, and that partly reflects the fact that this is an enormous national crisis for every country affected. And therefore, clearly, countries want to govern their own policies. But I think more lessons could have been learned at an early stage. Um, I think WHO has done the very best job it could do, 
given its level of resourcing and given the political and economic context this pandemic occurred in. Um, but they clearly all organisations have lessons can be learned. I think paradoxically across low and middle income, at least some low and middle income countries, there has been more coordination, cooperation in, in multiple sectors, uh, as has been pointed out. So it is a mixed picture. Uh, I think, though, there is clearly scope for for us to reflect once this is over on how to in, put in place mechanisms which allow a more coordinated uh, and coherent response globally to any future similar infectious disease threat, whilst remembering that countries are autonomous and want to make their own decisions. So um, this would be one of the of the lessons learned uh, to live with the virus in the long run, uh, this way to uh, have more coherent uh, initiatives. But what are your perspectives on that? Uh, it, 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 obviously, the elephant in the room is the vaccine, um, but maybe you have uh, other perspectives and uh, maybe you also have other uh, opti reasons to be optimistic um, uh, and uh, not only the vaccine. I mean, I'm, so we have seen a degree of global cooperation in, in the COVAX initiative for vaccines. Um, and in at least regional initiatives, such as within the European Union. But clearly, we're going to see, a, in terms of the countries which get the vaccine first, they're going to be the um, high-income countries, which have negotiated mostly bilateral deals, or at least sometimes at a regional level. So I'm afraid a lot of the world will be waiting quite a long time to get very large, certainly large supplies of vaccines. So one of the key things we've been looking at is how do you optimally allocate vaccines between countries? And that really comes down to population size, particularly population size in vulnerable groups and the elderly. Um, and then probably more realistically, for given a country gets a certain supply in a certain time frame, how do you fairly equitably and efficiently allocate that to have the maximum impact? And so we've done a lot of work on that, working with WHO and country stakeholders on, on, on using modelling analysis and our knowledge of the vaccine and who it affects worse, potential impacts on transmission, to, to look at optimal deployment strategies in the coming months. Those strategies may vary a little bit from country to country and setting to setting, depending on the availability of supply and the characteristics of the vaccine. So um, maybe, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Zainad Zuleyman Khan, uh, what kind of, uh, of bottlenecks uh, can you uh, imagine regarding uh, the fact that the tools are coming, but uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Servison said, maybe uh, we'll uh, we need more time to have it everywhere in the world, but they're coming. Uh, and do you, can you imagine some challenges that we can face um, in uh, the area where uh, you are uh, working and especially in remote areas? Um, definitely. As I, I was mentioning that as AKD and Aga Khan Development Network, we are already discussing uh, what uh, Neil talked about, that uh, we, we do not anticipate vaccines to come to the poor countries and, and rural areas we work in, 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 as I mentioned, Central Asia, Northern Pakistan, uh, uh, East Africa, rural East Africa. So, so we as AKDN are still very strongly talking about prevention. We have not given up on that as yet. So we are still going into our communities. We are still talking about the masks and, and, and physical distancing and, and the importance of trying to prevent and promote good practices related to COVID. Uh, while, of course, I, I, I talked about the, the global uh, procurement uh, uh, team, which is working at the AKD and leadership level, uh, working with uh, various WHO and other, uh, um, other vaccines uh, manufacturers to see how do we get access to it. But as Neil said, that the access is going to come via countries, and, and we have to work with the country's uh, governing, government to ensure that within the country, how do we get to the vulnerable population? How do we get to the healthcare, uh, healthcare um, providers because they are part of the vulnerable population? So as AKDN, we are now working with the governments uh, and the vaccine uh, manufacturers 
uh, to really prioritize uh, getting the vaccines to the right people as soon as we can. But prevention still stays the important uh, aspect for us. Uh, strengthening our hospitals in rural communities to manage ICU patients still stay as it stays as an important aspect for us because we will get vaccine, but it's it's not coming. Uh, a, 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 as soon, I mean, it would, we would like to get it as soon as possible, but it will take time for us. Thank you very much. Um, I just have an eye on the on the chat box, and uh, I have a question for Professor Ferguson. Quite long, I will read it. Huh? Uh, how do you we uh, how do you we a country like Afghanistan that apparently records low infection rates and very low mortality? Are these faulty statistics or a result of the country's demographic profile with few older people or just too early to analyze properly? End of the quote. That's a very good question. So first of all, I think it's an element of both in many low-income countries. Um, first of all, yes, countries where you have over half the population, sometimes over 60, 70% of the population under 20 years of age, and a much smaller proportion of elderly people are going to, you know, fortunately suffer a much lower mortality toll from this virus than, for instance, high income or um, some middle income countries with a much flatter demographic profile. But on top of that, I mean, many low income countries um, only have, you know, rudimentary of any um, vital registration systems to record deaths. So, and have very limited access to testing because of capacity limits. And therefore, it will take months, if not years, to really properly assess the mortality and morbidity toll of this pandemic in the poorest countries of the world. We've done some work on that. I mean, we published a report recently on what the situation in Syria, and particularly in Damascus, cross-checking Um, death certificates po posted by people living in Damascus on Facebook with um, mortality trends and calculated that probably only one to three percent of people who've died from COVID in, in that city have been reported as COVID deaths. And that's largely down to access to test testing, we think, rather than any particular deliberate under-reporting. Um, but, for instance, that city probably has experienced a catastrophic COVID epidemic. And we, we see even in middle income countries like Mexico, for instance, and um, South Africa, where they have had good amounts of testing and, and certainly vital re um, registration, that they've had a high burden of you know, COVID mortality reported. But then when you look at excess mortality, it's twice as large again. Um, So I think, as I said, it'll, it'll take months or years to really fully assess the toll of this pandemic. Thank you. I have another question uh, coming from the chat box for Dr. Dezinat. Um, is AKHS and Aga Khan hospitals, like in Karachi, also involved in the research of vaccine, or they are more focused in prevention? Absolutely. Uh, Aga, Khan, uh, Aga Khan Development uh, Network health agencies uh, are, are really cutting across the full spectrum of, of uh, management of a disease. So in terms of COVID, Aga Khan University Hospital in Karachi, Aga Khan University itself is a, and in Nairobi, we are very active in, in trials related to vaccines, in, in trials related to other modalities of the treatment of the disease itself. Uh, and of course, Aga Khan Health Services, which is working with the remote and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, ur urban and rural communities are, uh, are also dealing with uh, prevention and, uh, and taking care of the care, care of the patients. So really, the whole spectrum of the, of the disease is being managed by us. And Aga Khan University is very much involved in numerous uh, research related to COVID. A question for, uh, for uh, Professor Ferguson. Actually, it was for Dr. Sal, uh, who he, uh, unfortunately was not uh, able to join us, uh, the CEO of the Institute uh, Pasteur of Dakar. But I would like to um, uh, ask this question to you, uh, Professor. From now, uh, we need to continue with our 
prevention and protection measures and improved uh, treatments, but the solution will only come if and when uh, we'll have a safe and efficacious cure and or vaccine uh, that are distributed fairly. Um, what do you think, uh, what kind of, of action we can do to contribute to that common effort? At local level. Um, that's a very large question. Yes. Um, the, um, I think one of, I, I think it will depend on, you know, what you do and um, who you are. I think one of the things is, I mean, so the promise of vaccine and the early trial results are very encouraging and they give us, in some sense, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but as we know from many people in the world, even in the highest income countries, it will be several months, if not towards the end of next year before significant amounts of vaccine become available. And so we have to sustain the responses we have at the moment, which are going to involve very difficult trade-offs being made and very difficult decisions being made. I think perhaps the single biggest thing which we could all collectively do is try to move away from some of the polarization which has built up around this issue in some countries. Um, and to back to more of a co encourage community cohesion with clear government between uh, communication between government and citizens, but also within citizen groups themselves and within third party stakeholders. Um, otherwise, there is a risk, even in the highest income countries, that we will still see very substantial mortality between now and when we can finally roll out vaccine at scale. Another question for uh, Dr. Zinat. How successful has been the experience of field hospitals? Oh, I'm, I'm, I must share that experience of ours. Uh, we have, uh, uh, while, and I talked about our uh, spectrum of care, uh, especially in, in uh, countries uh, such as Central Asia uh, and Africa, uh, where tertiary care beds are not uh, enough. Or, or, or actually not there. So we uh, planned some field hospitals in, in uh, uh, Central Asia and, and uh, uh, East, East Africa, uh, where with the help of our donors, uh, we, we had instituted uh, critical care beds uh, in, in the middle of the mountains and uh, in, in the middle of the jungles, actually. And, 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 and again, Going back to the, the strength of AKDN, our Aga Khan University hospitals, which had enough capacity of, of human resources to deal with uh, these high, uh, very sick, critical patients, helped us at, at these field hospital Aga Khan Health Services staff. So together, we had to do uh, really fast human resource capacity building. Uh, infrastructural development, ensuring appropriate equipment and, and supplies are present there. And we are so proud to say that uh, uh, we have about uh, 100 or 115 beds uh, operational in the uh, East, Af uh, sorry, in the Aga Khan, um, Aga Khan Health Services, Northern Pakistan, uh, with a lot of ICU patients admitted. Uh, a success story, I think, is a 103-year-old uh, uh, man, gentleman, got recovered from from the critical care, and and uh, and we feel proud about it because it was uh, it is in the middle of nowhere where we were able to get our field hospitals uh, through the system strengthening and involvement of all the partners. So yes, we are we are very proud of that initiative. It's good to finish with a good initiative and with optimistic uh, reasons to stay optimistic. Just as a small catch-up wrap-up of the discussion, and I will give you the, the floor to, to finalize the discussion, but first uh, we recognize and we pay tribute to the scientific community and the health workers working uh, in the front line. Um, I understand that uh, we have to have a system thinking uh, at the very beginning of uh, the crisis and uh, have a rapid response uh, cross, uh, and cross-sectoral rapid response. Um, we need communication um, and we have this kind of triptych between public health intervention, community contract and social measures. And at the middle of that, trust. 
uh, and to build trust be, uh, within uh, communities and, and uh, in each uh, countries. Uh, for that, with trust, we need this political consensus. And knowing that uh, one solution um, doesn't fit for all and for the whole world, um, and we should uh, learn from uh, each other and to think, to discuss, to find solution globally, but to act locally uh, and to put in place some mechanisms uh, for those for, to, to, to have more coherent response um, locally and globally, uh, to have better allocations of uh, allocation of tools against COVID-19. And to, this is the disease of today, but maybe we will have also uh, to keep some mechanism for the disease of tomorrow. Unfortunately, we have to think about that for the future. Um, maybe one last word uh, on one last sentence for each of you, uh, from each of you, Dr. Zenat, please. Uh, you have summarized it quite well. I just want to conclude by saying that uh, uh, it, we all are facing this, we all are together in this, and one aspect of, of uh, 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 human resources, I think we need to capture that as a challenge in healthcare industry uh, for, to deal, and not just healthcare industry, but in all other aspects, we have to manage our uh, the sensitivities, the anxieties, the fears, and the health related to our uh, human resources uh, who are really the frontliner uh, dealing with uh, this COVID disease. Yeah, and I suppose I would finish by saying I would never have guessed a year ago that the world would have responded in the way it has to a crisis like this, despite I mean, the appalling toll of morbidity, mortality around the world, the huge economic cost, the way the world collectively has responded and communities have come together has saved many, many more millions of lives um, than I would have anticipated, frankly. Um, so I think there are things to, for everybody to be proud of and to be hopeful about for the future. Wow, thank you. Uh, I understand that the next session is the official ceremony, so I must give away to my president of the Republic, uh, who is certainly more eager to, uh, waiting than am I, uh, but not for you. But I would simply uh, like to warmly thank each of you. Um, and uh, as you said, that doesn't matter, we'll end this crisis together and or not at all. So uh, it is time to act together. Thank you very much, dear panelists, for showing us the way uh, your um, I wish you all an excellent day or, or evening, and I hope to see you soon in a more welcoming circumstances conducted to face to face exchanges. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Goodbye.